So thank you very much indeed. It's a delight that so uh, to welcome you here today at our webinar on the um, graphite materials. Uh, we're working together with Vault Resources on this and with DGWA. My name, we're just letting a few more people into the webinar. So whilst we're the people starting to um, come into the webinar, just give you a little bit of a background on the German Australian Business Council um, and our other business councils throughout Europe. So the German Australian Business Council is now almost 25 years old. We were set up in order to promote business between Germany and Australia. And we work together with a network of other business councils throughout Europe under the banner of Australian Business in Europe. We've been extremely pleased to welcome DGWA from Frankfurt as one of our members for several years now, and I'm sure Matthew Reynolds will tell us a little bit more about what DGWA has been doing when I pass over to him in a couple of minutes. But first of all, I want to welcome you to this webinar, which is the very first webinar in our uh, being coordinated by our raw materials focus group within the German Australian Business Council. As some of you know, the European Union has identified raw materials as being absolutely critical to the European, uh, to the European economy over the next few years. Um, obviously, it's some of the major suppliers of raw materials are in Africa and in China, countries in which there are, to put it mildly, challenges um, and ethical issues in extracting those materials. But of course, Australia, as well as another of other likely like minded countries also do have quite nice uh, re resources that we can use. And one of the things that we want to do within the German Australian Business Council in the next few months is to look at the opportunities that are open to European and to Australian businesses to improve the relationships, the economic and the personal social relationships between our two great countries. So with that introduction, I just wanted to highlight this webinar will be recorded. If you do not want your name to appear on the recording or your face to appear on the recording, please rename yourself um, so that you will not be identifiable on the recording and please turn off your camera um, if, you do, if you do not want people to see you. So with that, I will pass over to Matthew Reynolds to introduce a little bit about what DW, DGWA is doing and uh, what uh, Vault Resources is doing. So Matthew, over to you. Thanks, Robin, and thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. So my name is Matthew Reynolds. I work with DGWA here in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, DGWA is a boutique investment bank. Um, we assist Australian and global companies connect and engage with European investors and stakeholders. So as an Australian working in Germany, it's, like, it's incredibly exciting to see um, Australian companies working in the critical um, raw materials supply chain in Europe. As um, Robert mentioned, five, five years ago, no one was talking about um, raw materials, and now the conversation is everywhere, um, from world leaders to, to business um, to stakeholders. So it's a really incredibly um, exciting place to be at the moment. Um, and there's real immediacy and urgency to these discussions. Um, so as I said, what we do in Germany is we help Australian companies over here connect and engage with European investors. And there's, there's a surprisingly large number of Australian companies working in Europe. Um, Fault Resources, of course, our, um, our, our company we're talking to today, um, they have a very large graphite reserve in the Ukraine, and they're also exploring strategic opportunities for battery anode development also in Europe. There's Neo Metals that we work with as well, which is developing probably a global leader in battery recycling technology. Um, and it also has a vanadium project in Finland. Um, there's Eclipse Metals, which has got some very exciting rare earth projects in Greenland, and Prospect, uh, which is developing projects in Finland and Slovakia. So that's just a few. Uh, and as I said, it's, um, it's this Australian uh, willingness to, uh, I think, take risks with exploration um, and production capabilities and sort of reach out across the globe that I think is um, is really important for Europe as it seeks to meet its um, zero emission targets and to also meet its um, requirements under the EU Critical Raw Materials Act. And these companies, including Vault, are very well supported by Australian and also global investors. Um, and that's something that we 
you know, work very closely with them over here in Europe. And since we started working with Vault in 2021, uh, we, it's definitely probably one of the most traded true listed shares in Germany. It's engaged incredibly strongly with the European retail investment market. Um, and it's probably one of the most traded true listed shares on the German exchanges. Vault Resources is... Um, Prashant and Trevor will probably tell you that it's also engaged very strongly with EU agencies, such as the EIT Raw Materials Alliance and a European um, EIT Raw Materials. And our companies facilitated discussions in these areas as well. In terms of the tailwinds for companies like Bolt in Europe, um, there's some, you know, they're incredibly strong. We're seeing legislative tailwinds, such as the EU Critical Raw Materials Act, which is going to require diversification of supply, which is a big um, positive for companies like Vault that are operating in the graphite space, where graphite traditionally coming in from Europe is synthetic graphite out of China. Um, there's the battery passport legislation, which is going to require that every uh, physical battery have a digital twin, and that digital twin will have to have um, details around the CO2 footprint of the whole supply chain and also the CO2 emissions that have gone into that battery. And finally, of course, Europe's going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel engines by 2025. 2035. So all these um, legislative um, changes will provide, you know, we think massive tailwinds for companies like Bolt Resources in Europe. So in conclusion, you know, it's a great time for companies such as Vault Resources to be engaging in Europe and for investors and stakeholders to closely follow the narrative and the strategy and to sort of follow these companies on their journey. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Matthew, for that introduction to the activities that you're working on. The way we're going to run this webinar is the following. I'm going to ask um, questions for each of the participants. And after the first question, I'll ask them if they could just briefly introduce themselves. For those of you, you probably most, most of us are now very, very familiar with uh, Zoom, but to remind you that we have the questions and answer session, which is down at the bottom in the roughly in the middle. If you could put your questions into that area, not into the chat, um, well, that would be grateful. And I will try and handle them at the end. We hope to have about 20 minutes uh, just to handle uh, general questions. Um, we're not going to take um, interventions from the floor during this webinar, so please don't try and raise your hand or something like that. Uh, this is just to make it move very effectively. And finally, another reminder that we are recording this webinar. If you do not want your name to appear um, or your uh, video to appear, then please do not do that. So the first question I'd like to ask and is to Prashant. So Prashant, it's a great honor for you to actually come to um, join us today. Um, I wonder if you could firstly introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about what graphite is and what its importance is for uh, modern industry. I guess many of us, you you know, had their first experience with the so-called lead pencils, which actually had graphite uh, in them at school. Some of them uh, used them, obviously, to um, help um, with lubrication at, in our doors at home and the things like that. But I know the graphite goes is much, much more important than that. So if I could hand over to Prashant uh, for a brief introduction and just tell us a little bit what graphite is and why it's so important to the world. Absolutely. Prashant. Good afternoon, Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I want to echo Matthew's point. This is an exciting time to be in the electric vehicle, battery materials, clean tech industry. This is really amazing time where you have all the legislative forces, the financial forces, and of course, the mother nature wants clean solutions. So let's all work together. This is a win-win-win situation. Um, so let's maybe I can spend 30 seconds introducing myself. Uh, my name is Prashant Chintawar. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of World Resources. We are a company listed both on uh, ASX, Australian Stock Exchange, and FRA, Frankfurt Exchange. Uh, my background is primarily in uh, battery materials, electric vehicles, and specialty chemical industry. In fact, I started working in electric vehicles even when that industry wasn't uh, was pretty much nascent, almost an emerging industry back in late 90s. 
Um, and my uh, qualifications is actually in PhD in chemical engineering. And I have a track record of starting, creating, law and uh, dramatically scaling of businesses such as the specialty chemicals and battery materials, and also running large uh, product management p &L centers. So coming to your question, Robert, you're absolutely right. Uh, all of us essentially uh, got introduced to graphite when we started using HB or 2H pencils. Um, and actually, that's the similar graphite that we're using, but I think there's a lot of uh, differences between that graphite versus what we need to use in the electric vehicles. So just to put things in perspective, the lithium-ion batteries are really at the heart of this EV revolution. And these batteries contain graphite as a key ingredient as what is called as an anode material. Uh, in fact, these batteries contain, I would say anything from anywhere from seven to 10 times more graphite than lithium. So you may even want to start calling them graphite batteries. Graphite is actually also critical raw material, both in US and in Europe. And if you look at today's situation, China produces about 70% of the world's natural graphite and over 95% of global natural graphite annually. So the graphite that comes out of mine has to be refined, has to be chemically converted into what is called as a graphite anode. And as I said, China has over 90, 95% of the global market share today. So with the expected growth of electric vehicles, it's absolutely necessary for Europe to secure the supplies of graphite. And that's where the world subsidiaries have balanced the graphite comes into the picture. So that's fantastic. I I hadn't realized that China had such a domination of, of the marketplace as, until now. I'm going to ask Trevor a question. And Trevor, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, from uh, Perth uh, today, Perth, Western Australia today. A, a brief introduction about yourself. And it's my understanding, Trevor, that you were actually instrumental in the original acquisition of the uh, Zavalyevsky graphite business in the Ukraine or Ukraine. Could you please tell us a little bit more about the history of the mine and how you see the mine now fitting into the EU critical raw material stream in the future? Trevor, over to you. Okay. Um, yes, thank you, Robert. And uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, back in 20, in fact, it was 2020 when I first got introduced to um, the opportunity to um, have a look at the acquisition of an interest or shareholding in, in Zavaleski. Um, the appealing part of uh, that, um, that opportunity was the fact that it had been in operation since 1934, um, so very long-term um, production you know, highly experienced workforce because of the, you know, the multi-decade um, nature of the operations. Um, and you mentioned, I think, earlier on the, the size of the resource. Um, Zavaleski is uh, based on Russian code resources. So this is um, still some work that we plan to do is to convert it into one of the more um, understood sort of reporting codes like JORC in Australia for resource definition. But um, in the Russian code, it, it's well over 100 million tonnes of, uh, of graphite ore there in, uh, in the Zavaleski deposits. So, um, so what you're looking at is, is the opportunity for a business that um, is already, in European terms, the largest producer of graphite in Europe and has been um, on and off for, for a number of years. Um, Europe's actual requirements going forward, though, is uh, is pretty significant. I'll just touch on that in a minute. But um, so the opportunity for Zabaleski is to um, not only stabilise its produ production. Obviously, the you know the situation in Ukraine's been um, pretty volatile over the last couple of years, um, and that's um, that's probably held up our ability to. You know, advance the the Zavaleski project and the mine as much as we would like to, um, because of the uh, obviously the Russian invasion and the, and the disruption that that's caused. But um, you know, the opportunity for for Zavaleski in terms of the you know the supply of graphite into Europe is pretty clear. 
Um, you know, it's got a great, uh, it's got very good logistics. So access into Europe is um, it's really strong in terms of rail and road connections. Um, as I mentioned, it's the, the largest graphite resource in Europe. Um, and the opportunity to expand production and be a key supplier into the, you know, developing um, lithium ion battery market um, and other battery technologies for that matter um, is, is pretty clear. So um, when you have a look at, um, in fact, just last week, the European Raw Materials Alliance classified Zabileski as one of 50 key um, strategic projects or, or assets in Europe for the critical material supply chain. Um, and it's, uh, the demand in Europe is forecast to be a graphite alone by 2030 is one and a half million tonnes required to supply the battery industry in Europe. So when you think that current production's less than 20,000 tonnes per annum, you know, that's a long way to go um, for graphite supply to try and, you know, um, be a part of that in Europe. So, um, um, and uh, the I think the forecast by 2030 is that European supply might be about 20% of that total amount. So so Europe's still going to have to look externally to other, other projects, um, you know, in other countries for, for the supply of graphite, but clearly... Um, Savaleski's got a, a fantastic opportunity to be the uh, one of the um, you know key suppliers in Europe for graphite material for for lithium ion batteries. So um, yeah, and that that's pretty much the explain. Obviously, we've got Roman on the call as well, and he can talk a lot more about Savaleski as well. But uh, that that just gives you a bit of insight into the the decision there. So. Um, no, um, and we we acquired a seventy percent shareholding in the business, and and we obviously look forward to working with the Zavaleski management team and and you know, and making progress with our plans in uh, for this business. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much indeed. I think it's an exciting time, and I'm going to ask Roman. Roman Roman's got a really interesting background. We were just in the, having a little bit of a chat before we started the webinar. So, Roman, maybe I'll ask you to just to give a short version of um, what your, your background and how you came to be involved in Zavileski. And then I think one of the things that's really going to interest those listening and w uh, watching this webinar is just what it's like to be running a critical raw materials business in Ukraine at present. You know, what has been the major challenges? I say most of us are in Western Europe listening to this, so we get fairly regular updates um, from Kiev on something. But what's what's really happening on the ground, I think, is, is pretty unknown to the majority of us. So, Roman, give a bit of your background and then maybe just tell us a little bit what it's like within the business at present or within the country and uh, how you're working on the mine. So thanks very much, Roman. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robert, very much for this opportunity to take part in uh, in this uh, web webinar. So uh, I'm John Zawalewski, uh, Graphite and World Group in, in the end of the 2021. Before joining uh, World, World, I was working for uh, um, um, more than two years for the government uh, of Ukraine uh, as the deputy head of the state geology service of Ukraine. There was <clears throat> in charge of the mining licenses and the exploration of the minerals uh, uh, on the territory of uh, Ukraine. And uh, I also achieve, and this is uh, among uh, also um, what I achieved is that uh, uh, securing uh, the memorandum for the strategic partnership between the European Union and Ukraine for the critical uh, supply of critical minerals and uh, batteries. So uh, that was my start, and I was I'm very happy to uh, to promote this uh, this memorandum and to implement this memorandum already working for the Zawalewski and and Wolf uh, within the supply of the. Uh, or the graphite. <clears throat> so yes, uh, World uh, in 2021 uh, came with the uh, once purchased the company ca came with the robust pro uh, program for the further investment and enhancing uh, uh, our assets. 
but unfortunately the war introduced uh, some challenges in that uh, process and the co uh, company met uh, the challenge uh, the challenges in 2021 uh, sorry 2022 so um, there was uh, some uh, dis uh, disruption in the supply chain of the uh, materials uh, since for our production and our flotation process, we uh, use a number of materials which we need to source from different uh, places, uh, so like uh, metallic balls, sodium silicate, uh, uh, frother. By the way, frother was uh, one of the challenges that we needed to achieve in, uh, and to resolve in 2022. Uh, all, uh, all the history uh, before, uh, Zawalewski used uh, a Russian sourced uh, frother called Oxal T92, and that's uh, uh, jointly understood that after the big war began, we could not uh, use the Russian products. So we sourced, uh, sourced, and was looking testing for the frother for the from the different uh, uh, parts of the world. We uh, tested the frother from Australia, from China, uh, from Europe, and finally we. Uh, we um, uh, opt, uh, uh, opted for, for us a product for, from Europe, which is uh, slightly, uh, slightly more, uh, more expensive, but, uh, yeah. uh, but anyway, nothing to do with that. But on the other hand, uh, this is uh, exactly that's uh, called uh, cre creating a supply chain between uh, Ukraine and, and Europe. So we supply uh, graphite to Europe and we purchase some materials needed for, for our uh, processing uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Also, we, uh, we had some challenges with the drafting our people into the uh, military. Yeah, uh, so our ma uh, management team tried to work uh, uh, robustly with the local labor mar uh, market to uh, to meet our needs and uh, to have enough people for uh, for uh, running the business uh, we are quite quite okay with that uh, the wi the winter uh, was also a challenge for us since uh, in in autumn there started a number of the missiles attack and there was uh, disruption uh, in uh, grid, electricity grid, and uh, uh, even uh, even if we wanted to produce, was no pow power to to run the business. But fortunately, from the uh, from the March uh, or this year uh, situation uh, changed. We have enough of power, and uh, we already we started our first production campaign in uh, in April and already produced uh, uh, 1,000 tons of the graphite, met our target. So we come up with uh, some conservative approach uh, for, for this uh, year, 2023, uh, with a conservative production campaign, which consists uh, with the three turns uh, in each quarter. So we successfully <clears throat> ran our first production uh, campaign. Uh, we stopped for the uh, maintenance, and we are preparing for for our next campaign, which should be uh, in uh, uh, July or, or August. When you when you talk about a campaign, what do you what do you actually mean by a campaign, uh, Roman? So that's uh, so for some of our um, listeners won't be familiar with sort of some of the mining technology. So maybe just explain what you mean by a campaign. So gen generally, uh, company normally works each month. But uh, due to the challenges we have uh, within the world time, we have some problems with the supply of the materials. We have some problems with the working capital. So uh, we minimize our production volumes and uh, uh, put them in some stages and prepare and gather all the materials needed for, uh, for, for the run. Okay, fine. So thanks for that. That that that's absolutely superb. And actually, Prashant, maybe um, uh, you could um, just highlight something. Uh, you issued a press release last week um, on the Australian St Stock Exchange, um, talking about the restarting the operations and the camp, the new campaign, which uh, Roman has just mentioned. Um, could you just talk us through where you see this from a management point of view, um, or how things are going to develop in the next few months? Over to yeah, you, Prashant. Absolutely. 
Right, right. Thank you, Robert. So I want to kind of um, extend the chain of thought that Roman started. So typically mining operation or any industrial operation, as long as there is a demand, you want to run it as much as you can, correct? You want to run it either 24-7, 24-5, and roughly 350 days a year. Um, but as you know, unfortunately, the geopolitical situation in Ukraine remains very fragile. And this started back in obviously February of last year. So if you look at the Zelensky's production uh, pre-invasion from 2017 to 2021, we were producing about 7,500 tons per annum of graphite product. Unfortunately, that number dipped to only 846 tons last year, 2022. So what we did, we challenged Roman and his team, the Valensky management team at the beginning of the year to come up with a plan which produces significantly more quantity than 846 within, with reasonable assurance that yes, we can execute that plan because as he articulated, the supply chain still remains fragile. There are power cut down power shutdowns and not everything is within our control. So I'm really delighted to inform the audience that after the winter shutdown, his team was able to restart the operation in the middle of April and that was a camping. So you essentially start stop and after a certain time you restart the operation. <clears throat> So his team was able to produce during this campaign which started about three, four weeks ago now, a more than 1000 tons. And then we can we plan to actually have two additional campaigns in the third quarter of 2023 and the fourth quarter of 2023. So mm -hmm. the goal is to produce at least a thousand ton in each of these campaigns. And not to re-emphasize, but not to elaborate, it's very important for the audience to understand that despite all the situation on the ground, our team is safe in Ukraine, our assets are safe, equally important. But the team has really rose to the challenge. There are a lot of issues uh, there, and they really actually execute, successfully executed that campaign. Yeah. So 1,000 ton production may not sound a whole lot, but the reality is in Europe, as Trevor articulated, we are one of the largest or maybe the largest operating graphite mine. So we definitely need all the support, financial, legislative, moral support from everyone in Europe in order for us to actually continue to dramatic, continue to produce and eventually dramatically boost the production because this plant is not really currently operating at the capacity, nowhere close to that. Yeah. So in fact, we want to get to, we want to significantly ramp up the production and meet the local demand for this material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting, Prashant, and, I, and both Roman and you have highlighted the team aspect here. And I know from uh, some uh, Ukrainian friends uh, near where I live, you know, they are working quite normally, um, often remotely working for companies and based or based in Ukraine. But they say it's the, the worry, the tremendous worry, most of them have had uh, family members, nieces, nephews, sons, daughters conscripted into the Ukrainian forces, and some of them have unfortunately disappeared. So it must be a tremendous amount of pressure that the team is working under so it's a uh, you know hats off to you um matthew let's just go back you mentioned right at the beginning that um vault is one of the few dual listed um companies on both the uh, german stock exchange and the australian stock exchange uh, maybe just uh, what is dual listing? Could you just explain it for those of people who are a little bit unfamiliar? And, and maybe give us an indication, you know, is there been significant European investor interest in Vault's activities? Matthew, just uh, pass over to you on that one. Uh, thanks, Robert. So um, there's actually quite a number of dual listed companies uh, from the ASX that are listed on the German exchanges. Um, so I'll just briefly explain what it means. So if a company is trading on a on the ASX, um, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange considers that a recognized global exchange. So uh, they will list the company's shares um, on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And uh, it's a relatively simple process. There's no administrative or, or compliance costs. And the, the big benefit of that for companies like Vault is it allows uh, European investors to, um, to, to participate in the company, to, to buy shares, uh, relatively low cost in Europe and without exchange risks. So um, they can buy um, 
of many of the apps. So in Europe, there's um, there's apps like uh, Trade Republic and, and others that allow very easy uh, for European investors to trade the shares. So it facilitates um, companies like Vault, have it, enabling them to have a global investor base. Um, and the benefits of that, uh, you have a, you know, you broadens your your investor base around the world. You have engaged investors, um, and specifically for companies like Vault um, with a, uh, a European project such as the Ukraine um, and a European strategy uh, to provide battery owner material. This is something that um, retail investors in Europe follow very closely uh, and uh, they are able to, through the dual listing process, they're able to, uh, to buy shares uh, in Europe. So, yes, I, I think it's been a real positive for Vault. Um, as I said, since we're working, we've seen a significant increase in their um, in the European shareholder base. And these, you know, uh, the German investors are very passionate and they follow the company on the equity sites and they discuss the company uh, and its operations. And, the, and, uh, and I think that's a positive for companies, an engaged um, investor base that's globally uh, participates in the activities of the company, I think, can only be a positive. Right. No, I think that's, I think that's very interesting. And it's interesting as you were talking about how easy it is to, to, to buy for Europeans now to buy. I was just looking at a trade Republic on my phone and uh, I, I was able to, uh, I could purchase whilst we're talking sort of Vault Resources <laughs> yes. shares if I'd yes. wanted to. So I hadn't realized just how, how easy it is this uh, dual listing that um, is going to happen. Um, Prashant, um, we, We've talked a lot about um, the Ukrainian situation. Um, we've talked about uh, the earlier parts that uh, you, the, you, what's coming out of Ukraine will actually be only part of um, the European supply. Where's the rest of the supply coming from? Is Vault Resources looking at other sources of graphite around the world or more in Europe or in the Ukraine? Maybe you could just uh, give us some indication, as far as you can, obviously, of, of your future plans in graphite, or is it you just focusing on the mine in the Ukraine? No, that's a good question, Robert. So let me actually give kind of a two-part answer to that question. First is kind of what's the demand versus supply situation specifically for the European market? And then what is world's global strategy beyond the, beyond the project, beyond the mine, beyond the operating mine that we have in Ukraine? Um, so just to put things in perspective, a typical electric vehicle contains anywhere from 50 to 60 kilowatt hour of a lithium ion battery pack. So you're looking at roughly 50 to 60 kilogram of graphite. And even if you assume half of that is synthetic graphite, half of that being a natural graphite, you're looking at 25 kilograms of graphite in each car, natural graphite. And now compare that with the actual production we have from the Ukrainian mine, 7,500 tons per annum. What it tells us is the current graphite production in Europe is not in a, even sufficient for producing 200,000 of electric vehicles. I'm almost certain the market is much, much larger than that. So mm. there's a significant demand versus supply gap. And obviously, Ukraine, our Zvalensky graphite is one part of the solution. But I assume, presume that this is actually not the only solution. We definitely will be ramping up the capacity, both on the uh, graphite side and the graphite anode side in the European market. But we definitely also want other players to come participate in this uh, growth story. Okay. So what is the world's strategy beyond Ukraine? So we really, I like to think that we're kind of very lucky, we're blessed. We have two high quality graphite assets. The one is in Ukraine that's been in operation since 1934. And another project is in Tanzania that became, which is 100% owned by Volt as of now. So we plan to bring that online starting 2025, 2026 timeframe, and it will be brought online in two stages. The stage one will be about 24,000 tons of graphite. And as of now, we have already secured binding off text for that 24,000 tons of graphite. And then the stage two would be between 170 to 200,000 tons of graphite, which will come online in about 2027 timeframe. So at that capacity of 170 to 200,000 tons, it will be one of the largest graphite assets in the world. So we want to be really truly known as the graphite, the graphite anode company. 
our strategy is very simple. We want to focus only on few things, which is graphite and graphite anode material. They're both connected, very intimately connected. We only want to focus on Europe and North American market. And that's our struggle. That's our strategy. That's, that's how we want to go after the market. So again, this is really all about um, cooperation, competitive cooperation, because if you really look at the Kind of a side note over here. If you look at the gist of the store, gist of the success uh, for the Asian lithium-ion battery industry, which is more than almost 31 years old now, which started back in Japan in 1992, it's really this whole creation of the entire ecosystem. Not only the battery, but the battery guys, manu pack manufacturers, critical raw material producers, they all are working in one ecosystem to ensure the joint success. And I hope we can replicate the same story, both Europe and in North America. That, 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 that's absolutely fantastic as, as well. Trevor, um, so we talked a little bit about the European Raw Materials Alliance. And um, I think uh, that uh, Matthew or yourself said how supportive that the European Union has been. How where do you see the relationships with the EU agencies going in future? How are you going to start interacting with the uh, Critical Raw Materials Act? Maybe you could give a little bit of your thoughts from the side of Vault, Resor uh, Vault Resources. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess you know, as soon as we actually invested in, uh, in Ukraine and in the Zabolesky business, um, we joined the European Battery Alliance and also the European Raw Materials Alliance, which are both agencies um, uh, within the European Union for developing the, the critical minerals and, and battery, you know, and a key part of that is the, the battery material supply chain. So, Part of the uh, part of that facilitation is, uh, or part of the, I guess, the services that those agencies provide is, you know, to assist companies to develop their businesses, develop their supply chains, their strategic partnerships. Um, so consequently, they they can assist in introducing investors, introducing finance, um, introducing um, customers, uh, strategic customers. So these could be car. OEMs or, or battery manufacturers, um, and uh, and also you know assisting in the facilitation for your, you know your expansion plans and these sorts of aspects. You know we one of the things I guess that um, we're still pulling together is is what is you know the the overall um, outlook for. The Zabolesky business. Obviously, we see you know really strong demand growth in Europe for graphite materials for you know for the EV um, market and and other and you know stationary storage as well for you know in terms of battery usage um, because of the large resource base and you know mentioned over hundred million tons um, of ore. Um, the project grades around six and a half to seven percent. Um, graphite or TGC. So when you multiply that by over 100 million tonnes, you, you can see there's probably six and a half to seven million tonnes of graphite in Tabaleski. So producing at seven and a half thousand tonnes per annum doesn't make a lot of economic sense. So obviously one of the things that we'll be looking at is when, when the time is right and when you know, investments will come to the project, and obviously we need some stability in Ukraine for that to occur. But you know, the opportunities to expand production out of Ukraine significantly, and here I'm, you know, um, we're not set yet on what that number will be, but um, you know, clearly you increase production to say a hundred thousand tons a year of graphite. And you would still have, you know, over 60 years of, of graphite supply based around the resource base. Um, so um, those are sort of opportunities that will require, a, you know, a large amount of investment. But when you think that Europe is going to need, you know, um, around about a, one and a half million tonnes of natural graphite by the end of this decade to meet its um, requirements for battery production, then... Um, uh, lithium ion battery production, then yeah. you know, be the size of, of the opportunity. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the opportunity is obviously massive. Just remind people if they have a question um, to put it into the Q&A section here. And I'll take the opportunity to actually uh, go back to Roman on uh, to, to answer one of the questions here, because we've talked about the opportunities in Zavalieski. And uh, Roman also mentioned um, that during the winter period, you'd had to cease operations. I guess it was probably because of cold inclement weather. I don't know whether it snows. Oh, by the way, somebody sent me a message saying, whereabouts is the mine actually in uh, the Ukraine? I know it's down near the Moldovan border, so maybe you could uh, highlight that just a little bit more, uh, Roman, where you're actually located. Um, the question is, will there always have to be a winter shutdown, or was this just uh, because of the uh, special circumstances? Are yeah. you actually able um, midterm to consider a year-round mining? So, Roman, over to you, maybe quick, whereabouts are you actually based, um, at the mine based, obviously? to you and keep today um, and then will there always be a winter shutdown or will you be able to do all year round mining in the future roman so thank you Robert, for the question so historically before zavalinsky graphite uh, for the for the last decades uh, they did not work in uh, in winter due to the uh, negative temperature but uh, first the situation changed we see the last year that uh, the, the, the weather in the winter in Europe zone is uh, getting more warm and warm. So this, uh, this year we even uh, didn't see the temperature, uh, temperatures below uh, minus 10. Uh, so generally mo uh, quite moderate uh, winter. And the reason we did not work uh, this winter was uh, uh, major majority was uh, uh, electricity shut down and the grid uh, uh, destroyed. So we uh, we know how to cope with it uh, with this issue. Working for the winter, we we have uh, uh, two generally two two solutions. Was one is uh, we call quick uh, quick wins, uh, very cost effective. Just uh, changing the angle of the pipe and. Uh, uh, with uh, this kind of the moderate winter, we uh, we uh, we keep uh, producing. Uh, but for the longer term, we will need uh, slightly more investments uh, in changing the pipe, uh, uh, changing the metal pipe to the uh, new composite plastic pipe, which uh, which has uh, a totally different uh, performance. And uh, I think in uh, uh, in the next year we already can. Uh, once the let, let's say i assume that uh, we will win the war and the next year we can try to work already uh, in winter and uh, the next story is uh, uh, everything about investment okay no that 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 that's very interesting yes and uh, i think we'll keep on coming back to the investment and in fact there's one interesting question that um that um, occurs, which is um, Australia has often been criticised that it's been uh, just an exporter of the raw materials, and much of the value is actually being added outside of Australia, the processing of the minerals and the conversion into um, final products. And I think that's a, possibly a question to Prashant, which is that I know that you've talked, I think publicly talked about putting, you know, developing a battery anode plant in Europe. How do you actually see retaining much more of the value within Ukraine, within Europe, from the uh, mined graphite? And where do you see Volt resources playing a role? Prashant, over to you. Okay, okay. That's a good question. Um, so <laughs> the simple answer to that question, Robert, is we follow our customers. And <laughs> our customers are essentially the battery manufacturers, the cell manufacturers, and there's been multiple public announcements, especially for the European continent. We have North World, we have Freyer, which are really domestic, uh, domestic manufacturers, plus some, um, some other Asian manufacturers which are, which are setting up their battery production facilities in Europe. It goes without saying that we have to be really geographically close because of the legislation, because of also the actual practical aspects of running this industry. And as I was alluding to, the part of the reason these Asian manufacturers have dominated this industry is really this creation of this ecosystem where all are working together as one, one unit in order to make the whole industry successful. So, <clears throat> 
We have already announced that we plan to have a European natural graphite anode plant, which is mostly like, which will probably rely on the graphite coming from Roman's uh, asset in Ukraine. So we are going to use the European graphite, convert it in Europe into the natural graphite anode, which will be sold to the battery companies which are setting up operations in Europe as we speak. So mm -hmm. we announced this relationship with the company called Worley Engineering a few months ago. Worley is one of the world's largest, most reputed uh, engineering companies, engineering procurement construction company, and they have a significant expertise, especially when it comes to designing these graphite anode processing facilities. So we started working with them. And then we expect this work to be over before the end of 2023. And then our current thinking, current planning is the European natural graphite anode plant will come online in 2026, 2027 timeframe. It all depends on the customer qualification and also the financing of the project. But we are definitely committed to Europe as a region, not only because of the geographic presence through the Ukrainian mine, but we also want to forward integrate into the natural graphite anode. So we want to capture all the value into the battery material and keep that value in Europe. No. That, that, very interesting. So obviously you're going to be focusing very much on the battery, um, but graphene has, graphite has got several other um, opportunities. Um, uh, so we have a question here. Um, would it be suitable, for example, for the manufacturing of graphene, sort of this new material that people are looking around, or is that not of interest to you in particular, but you're just going to be focusing on the battery um, anodes? I don't know if that's uh, Prashant or Trevor to answer that question. I'll take a crack and then I'll uh, ask Roman and Trevor to jump in. Um, so yes, graphite has multiple applications, multiple uh, industrial uses, including graphite, graphite refractories, steel manufacturing, you name uh, all, all sorts of things. The reason we're focusing on the battery materials is twofold. One is actually today, in fact, starting late 2022, the batteries have become the largest market for graphite materials. So that's the growth. And in fact, if you look into the graphite product breakdown of, uh, of Ukrainian mine, we believe that it's actually ideal and suitable for the lithium ion battery applications. And we have tremendous data to back up that claim. That does not mean we're ignoring other applications. In fact, the majority of the sales today are for non-battery applications. Uh, but I will let Trevor and Roman elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what, uh, what what I can uh, okay. ask that uh, generally Zawalewski graphite is co considered uh, a, a high quality and it's known in, in the world since uh, the big the big history and the graphene markets is, is emerging market that's normally done from the graphite and we already have uh, some uh, inquiries and the potential customers who are willing to to buy our uh, graphite for the producing uh, for the, the graphene. We had some test, uh, testing in the St. Poland uh, institutes, which, uh, uh, which stated that uh, our graphite is suitable for the producing graphene. We already have some inquiries from uh, let, even Latin America, from, uh, from Brazil. The, la the last we, we have, the, the company is interested in our product. So uh, uh, our target, the target of the world is for, for sure uh, delivering our graphite for the battery and not market, but that uh, not eliminates the use of our graphite for other industries. Okay, that, that's right. And somebody's just reminded me um, that um, the, U, U, the US with their um, IRA Act is investing enormously into the Green Deal and apparently is also going to be investing in mining facilities in the United States. Are there going to be opportunities for the European Union to invest in facility, uh, invest in resources like um, the Zivaliski? Is this a, a, an avenue that you're exploring to see what um, uh, opportunities for investment subsidies are going to be available in the near future? Or, or is this, uh, again, an area where the European Union is um, lagging behind the uh, these proposals in the United States? Um, I can I can take a crack and um, so 
Yes, the Inflation Reduction Act, which became a law back in August of 2022, is, is truly a game changer uh, because it provides tremendous amount of both the financial incentives and the legislative support for localization of these clean tech electric vehicle battery industries. Uh, not only that, in, in, in fact, prohibits these materials coming from certain countries or foreign countries, entities of concern. Um, so the European Union, I would also say, is doing similar things. If you look at what is happening with ERMA, with the EIT, and also EBRD, there are legislative mechanisms which are being put in place to ensure that the industry also grows in Europe uh, and remains competitive. Right. Now, I think um, certainly we know about the European Union Critical Raw Materials Act, and I think that's going to be uh, give some absolute opportunities. I'm going to take just a couple more questions if anybody's got anything that they want to put up on the question and answer chat. But um, whilst I'm doing that is, um, and whilst you're doing that, um, the other thing we haven't talked about is obviously the various supply chain laws that are going to be introduced. So the Germany has already introduced its law where uh, manufacturers are going to have to be much more vigilant about uh, the their various companies in the supply chain. Um, and obviously, I think a company like Vault Resources, being a publicly quoted company in Australia, um, and in Germany, as we've just heard, is obviously extremely aware, probably much more open than many, many mining companies are. And, you know, just for example, as I was work preparing for this webinar, I spotted that you on your website, you have an, a very long report or a very comprehensive report on environmental and social and government issues, which uh, um, is obviously a critical part of the supply chain issues. Uh, Trevor, maybe you could say how you are tackling these ESG issues and the various supply chain requirements that are being legislated in Europe and I think in the United States as well. Yeah, um, it's, it's, as you said, a pretty critical area for, um, for most, well, for all companies and particularly where you're um, looking to develop supply chains from, you know, from basically raw materials. So, you know, from source all the way through to the doorstep of an end user, which is, you know, either a car um, OEM who's, you know, producing batteries or a, or a battery manufacturer. So, so the business that model that we're following um, does require us to make sure that we implement appropriate ESG principles. Um, the document you're referring to is our, our framework for how Vault will manage um, its implementation and uh, development of um, its environmental, social and governance programs. Um, our, uh, in fact, we're, we're just in the process of um, implementing a reporting tool um, so that we can measure our progress along a whole series of criteria which follow the, the World Economic Forum um, principles. So it's um it's it's a pretty full uh, program that we're developing and the plan is that you know we implement that at, at the vault corporate level and then that cascades and is implemented down through our different activities and and you know we've mentioned that we've got a project in Tanzania so that's one area that we'll be implementing those programs and and obviously you know looking to roll things through into the Zavaleski business as well so so we're committed to doing that we you know we think it's a key part of our business, um, I think for all businesses are going to have to um, look to manage and, and implement these sort of principles throughout their whole operations. So, you know, managing things like carbon emissions and measuring them and, and reducing them and, uh, but also things like social investment, um, obviously in, in some of the jurisdictions we had, you know, the, the impact on the community in Ukraine we're in um, Zavalia, um, where the mine's located. Um, as you know, as Roman mentioned, you know there have been conscripted people. We've lost employees to, you know, to the military service, and and some of those people won't come back, um, obviously. And so, you know, the impact on the township, and uh, but the contribution that we can make to, you know, restore and and you know create opportunities in the community through developing Zabaleski and expanding it, um, but also the same things in Africa where our mine's located in a, a very low socioeconomic area. So 
you know, um, mining while it, you know, gets a fair bit of criticism, <laughs> you know, because of the activities we're engaged in. But uh, I, I think, you know, mining creates enormous opportunities and makes, you know, huge differences to um, the communities that we operate in um, and provides tremendous opportunities and benefits. Yeah. I think that was a, that's a really nice aspect, you know, to slowly round this seminar up. I just wonder, Roman, if I could ask you just to give a few final words, your thoughts about um, how the business is going to go, how Ukraine is going to develop, and how the relationship with the European Union and Australia is going to develop. Um, just to wrap up this seminar, Roman, if you could say just a few words. Uh, so generally, I'm more than convinced that this year will be the year of the victory of Ukraine and uh, all the uh, bad stories will, will be lifted and uh, we finally could uh, uh, take more investment and to uh, enhance our assets because Zawalewski is, uh, just believe me, has a tremendous, tremendous perspective, uh, perspective. So ge generally, if we speak about the geology, there are uh, four, uh, four different graphite bearing zones in uh, in Ukraine and Zawalewski sits within the major graphite bearing zo zones called the Pobuzhia uh, gra graphite bearing zone which is by the name of the river which goes close to, uh, close to the mine and just uh, just for now the Zawalewski the bigger Zawalewski field uh, um, accounts for around 100,000 tons of, uh, of the graphite but the, there is still a huge upside potential for the further exploration works on the flanks uh, of the um, uh, of the deposit uh, itself, since we are sitting in in the center of the big graphite uh, bearing uh, region. So uh, uh, that's not also also about uh, Zawalewski history that it, uh, we are producing from the 1934, but it's more about our uh, future that uh, we can uh, explore and deliver even, even uh, more um, uh, more or uh, more graphite to to the European uh, Union. The second point is that the, uh, Zawalewski is, sit is situated geographically in a good uh, uh, in in good territory and point of the Ukraine where it has a lot of the solar radiation and we are we have a lot of land more than. Uh, 1,000 hectares of the land, so we can install additionally a solar panel station, which uh, which uh, meets our ESG principles and uh, will enhance our uh, liquidity, will lower our cost, but also will will meet uh, will uh, meet uh, ESG uh, uh, levels. The second point is that. Uh, the river goes close to the mine, and there is yet opportunity to install a hydropower plant with megawatts. So, uh, yet, uh, yet, so we see that in the middle term, we have a number of the good projects to, de to develop, which will uh, create an integrated and cumulative effect. Okay, fine. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, you know, look, for giving us that uh, outlook on some of your plans for the future. Prashant, maybe you'd just like to, to wrap up the uh, this webinar from the side of Vault Resources. I think we've, 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 we've had a, a fantastic introduction to what you're doing. So Prashant, just a, a few words to, on behalf, maybe give a little bit of an outlook on your relationship with Europe in the near future. So pr over to you, Prashant. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. So I think it goes without saying that uh, uh, the rapidly growing electric vehicle, this uh, battery industry is really, truly once in a lifetime opportunity. I, I don't think it's only for Ward, but several other ASX listed Australian companies. The demand for graphite, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, all these materials, which are the key commerce of the batteries, will simply grow dramatically. The numbers are anywhere from 20, 25 to 30 percent CAGR, depending on which material you're looking at. So this is really a, an opportunity for natural resource companies to transform them into really high margin, high quality businesses, getting into this material production and really becoming a part of this new EV ecosystem. So we definitely are looking forward to working with all the companies in the European continent, all our supply chain partners. So we want to cooperate with them. We want to work from, with them. We want to learn from them. And we want to make this as a win-win story for everybody. 
Thanks very much indeed, Prashant. And I can assure you from the side of the German Australian Business Council, we want to make a, this a win win for, 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 for you, for the ecosystem. And I think, you know, you can be really proud that your engagement actually within with Ukraine. I mean, we saw the way Germany recovered from the, the, the devastation of the Second World War by investment from around the world into the German economy. And I think it's the most important thing that we will be doing with the Ukrainian economy once the war is over, hopefully, as uh, Roman has said in the course of the coming year, um, to see more investment from Australian companies into the resources, the natural resources of um, Ukraine, into the opportunities that the Ukraine will offer. And I hope also that we'll be able to keep a lot more of the value within Ukraine and within the European Union. And so it's great to hear about your battery plant. Matthew, um, thank you very much indeed for um, helping to arrange this webinar. I just wonder if you'd just like to say a couple more words before I um, uh, before I sign off. Just to give uh, let you know, we do have a raw materials focus group within the German Australian Business Council. Um, those of you who signed up will have been given the opportunity to to sign up to our to our membership of the focus group. It's it's free free of charge for members, obviously, of the German Australian Business Council and our fellow AB members. So please. Feel Feel free to get involved. Please, if you've got any ideas of other raw material topics that you would like us to offer to talk about, do feel free to give your um, your views. We are hoping in the uh, European autumn, so um, sort of September, October time, to get um, somebody from the um, from the Australian government to also talk about um, how they see the uh, European Critical Raw Materials Act, as well as hopefully some uh, people from uh, uh, the European Union to talk about this. Matthew, I'll get give you the last word. Thank you once again for organising and getting uh, three fantastic speakers to, to join us. We've been a real privilege to hear Prashan talking about the practical problems, uh, sorry, Roman Pelkum about the practical problems, and then from Trevor and Prashan to talk about how they see the future of Vault Resources and their engagement within Europe. So just over to you, Matthew, for the final words. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. And just very quickly, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Robert. Uh, I think you did a brilliant job today moderating the session and, and thank the GABC, I think, for their passion in the, the critical raw material space. So we hope to work, you know, closely with you going forward. And thanks, Trevor, Prashant and Roman uh, for showcasing bulk resources. I think it's, uh, you know, as I, I just want to echo what Robert said, I think this uh, exciting time for Australian companies in the critical raw material space to be engaging with and to to connecting with um, with Europe, investors and stakeholders, and I think I think Vault's doing a doing a fantastic job, and, and we look forward to continuing to work with the company for a long time. So, thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you. very much indeed. Have thank a good you. day. Thanks, Bye -bye. Matthew. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.